thing is, uh, I just came up with this. Uh, tell us where you, tell us where you, um, the, the geographic location, name the geographic location of your first memory. And then uh, the third is um, how you, just one word about how you feel right now. So um, I'll, I'll start off by modeling. Uh, my name is Chris Jonas. Uh, my first memory is in Glendale, California. Um, and, um, and how I feel right now is I'm, I feel delighted. So uh, Katie, you wanna go next? Yeah. And I'm then gonna... call out who, if somebody on the screen that you see uh, can come next. Okay, sure. So I'm Katie um, and my first memory, I think is probably here in Santa Fe because I was born and raised here. <laughs> um, and the way I'm feeling now is um, just nervous excitement. <laughs> And um, I will pass it over to Brent. I see Brent here. <laughs> Hi, everybody. I'm, I'm Brent Herrera. And uh, my first memory would be up in Cuba, New Mexico, uh, on my grandpa's property. Uh, and I'm actually looking at uh, his house. And uh, how I'm feeling right now is excited to be here and excited to participate. And then do I pick somebody? Okay. Um, I'm going to go with Jim. My name is Jim Moore. And my first memory would be inside a house in Topeka, Kansas. And I'm thrilled to be a part of this discussion. Enrique and uh, Esteban and I have been communicating about this. And you can you can pass it over to somebody else. Uh, Daniel. Thinking that might be me. There. Oh, great. <laughs> I, I'm Daniel Banks, and I am thrilled and excited to see my New Mexico fam here. And I am current, oh, my first memory uh, is in Boston, Massachusetts. And I would like to pass it to the one and only Alicia Luares Maldonado. Hi. Hi, Daniel. It's so good. I'm looking around the room and seeing faces. So really great to be here. Um, my name is Alicia. And early memories are in my community of Atrisco uh, in Albuquerque in the South Valley. Um, and what was the other, what was, how am I feeling? Um, feeling really excited, uh, taking a plunge into doing some more oral history work in my community. So that's very exciting. Um, and I will pass it to, oh, I've got to see the names here. Uh, how about Eric Romero? Mi buenas tardes, queda de ustedes, su humilde servidor, Eric Romero. I am your humble servant. And I'd like to suggest that I could remember my birthday because I was born in the adobe house that my uh, my my family, my grandfather, my grandfather, grandmother contributed to it. And I was delivered at home by a partera. Um, but I, I'm trying to create the vivid memory of that. I might not reach other. So I'm just going to go with my, my, my father's garden. I spent a lot of time there as a childhood and learn so much about life and living and loving and, and just fond memories to the day, even half a century after the fact. I'm, I'm really pleased to be here and, and to be able to contribute to the project as well. Thank you all. I'm sorry, Let, let's go with Gayla. Hi, I'm Gayla. Um, I, um, my first memory is in College Station, Texas, in a house, also in a house, um, and I'm super curious today, right now, and I choose uh, Monica. Thank you, Gila. Uh, yes, my name is Monica, and my first memory 
takes place in dream space. And I am, I'm happy to be here, but how I feel, I feel like Lucille Ball at the conveyor belt, trying to keep up with all the bonbons. I'm just in general, a little overwhelmed. Uh, nonetheless, so happy to be here. And I would like to have a moment to connect and say, take it away, Trisha. Hello, so good to see everyone. Um, my name is Trisha Martinez and my first memory would be in my grandmother's kitchen in Cheyenne, Wyoming. Um, and I am feeling blessed and productive. So um, let's pass it on to Mimi. Hi everyone, my name is Mimi Roberts. Um, my earliest memories are gonna be close to uh, Chris's in Monrovia, California, where I wasn't born there, but my family moved there when I was uh, old enough to start having memories. And I'm feeling very, very excited to be here with everyone and also to be a part of this uh, Manitos project. And I would like to pass things on to who hasn't spoken yet, um, Jordan. Hi, I'm Jordan. Uh, my first memories are in the in Columbia, Missouri, in the backyard, and I'm feeling curious. And I'll pass it on to Robin. Hi, I'm Robin, and um, my first memory was probably in the, the Sandia foothills um, as a little kid, and um, I'm feeling content, and I will pass it to Maria. Hi, I'm Maria Singleton. And my first memory is playing in the yard with my multiple siblings in DeKalb, Illinois. And I'm feeling curious and excited to be a part of this. Thanks. I will choose, David, did you go yet? We'll go with David. All right. Hi, I'm David. Um, my first memory is in Connecticut, like um, being outdoors, and I'm feeling excited to be here. Um, who did I pass it to? Has Jackie gone yet? Okay, great. Hi, everyone. Uh, super stoked to be here. Um, my earliest memory, honestly, is uh, being dressed up in this very pink, uh, very lacy, puffy dress as, as a child and, and feeling like, oh my god, this isn't me. Why do I have to dress up like this? <laughs> um, and today I'm feeling I'm feeling a little cold. I'm gonna step away and get a jacket. It is it is snowing and things up here mm. in Lenape. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, let's see who uh, am I the last one to go? I know I came in a little late. Is there anybody else? We've got a few more. Um, oh, okay. Um, so can you put your hand up if you haven't gone yet? Okay, Rich. Great. Thank you. My name is Rich Schrader, and probably the strongest first memory is the 1973 Bur Burbank earthquake. And I remember waking up and looking out my window, and the, the garage went. And uh, then we all ran outside, and we forgot my sister. Um, so yeah, California. I am feeling very activated right now. So, like activated in a real engaged way. It's like weird. Yeah. So I pass it on. I don't know if Claire Coat went, but I got in late, so I'm not sure. Thanks. I got in later than you, so thank you. <laughs> um, I'm Claire Cote, and I um, 
think my earliest memories are of um, of becoming a big sister and um, dealing with uh, with being suddenly being an older sibling instead of a an only child and um, and adapting to um, to this little little being and um, so yeah just how 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 I my relationship with my parents and stuff changed with that so that's my, I think my, my, my earliest memories and also around around my sister's birth too like what activities happened and things around that so yeah and I'm feeling I'm really excited to be on this call but I am very scattered right now and going in way too many directions as a mom myself too many projects grant deadline blah blah blah, blah. so a little bit scattered but really happy to be here and you can go ahead and pass it to someone we have a few more people to go abby bowling if she hasn't gone yet uh, good timing i just got off the work call sorry about that um so i'm abby bowling uh, originally from the south valley of albuquerque um it's nice to see you again chris and daniel I've worked with you guys a couple times um i'm here joining the humanities council um my first memory was uh, i guess around three months when i my parents took me to dc and they were walking around the the mall and i had to ask my mom where that came from and she she told me about it later so um sorry i lost track of who hasn't gone yet i said it took a work call somebody want to help me out all right uh katie oh my hi oh, go ahead uh my name is katie gray and uh my first memory uh is in santee south carolina and um, I, I think I'm like Claire, and I think Monica said this as well, feeling a little bit like there's a lot to do. And I'm, I'm uh, a little, um, sometimes I think about that line from um, Lord of the Rings, where he says he feels like butter scraped over too much bread. <laughs> so, you know, a little, a little bit uh, like that, but still really excited to, to hear uh, what you all are going to say today. Um, and so I think, Eva, have you gone yet? I don't think you have. No, I I have it. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm Eva. My first, uh, what did you say? Geographical location memory. Well, New York City. Um, and I'm I'm really in, enthused about hearing more about. I feel like I'm learning it right now about what little globes uh, sort of processes. And I'm going to pass it to Nancy. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Nancy. Um, my first geographical memory I'd have to say is in Zacatecas, Mexico in the home that I grew up in. Um, and I'm feeling quite uh, inspired actually today. So excited to be on this call, thank you. And um, Sorry, I also forgot. Um, I think, uh, Michelle? Yes. Uh, so Michelle, just, just to tell us your name and your, the, the geographic location of your first memory and how you feel right now. Oh, I'm sorry. I just, I just joined in, so I, I missed the... Um... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, my name is Michelle. I'm with the New Mexico Humanities Council. And my first memory of my geographic location, wow. Um, hmm. I, I can't answer that right now. That's just, I don't know. I haven't thought about that in a long time. And I have forgotten my, I think I have forgotten my first memory. How do I feel right now? Um, I feel I feel uh, good to be here with with uh, with everyone here and looking forward to this program. Thank you. And then we have a few more who haven't spoken. Uh, Marissa, I think you haven't said we haven't introduced you yet. 
Am I here? Hello, I'm Marissa and um, my first memory is with the goats and chickens on Cerro Gordo um, behind my grandmother, my great grandmother's house. And um, I'm feeling uh, inspired, excited and scattered all at the same time. Um, and I'm happy to be here. Thank you. And uh, JT? Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Jesse or JT. Um, uh, geographic location of my first memory is in Florida, Sarasota. So I'm a Gulf Coast baby. Um, riding my big wheel to the store to get candy that I wasn't allowed to get because I didn't have any money and it was also too spicy. It was Red Hots. <laughs> And um, I'm feeling good and calm and um, hungry in, in many different ways. And it's just lovely to be here with y'all. Thanks. Great. And uh, Esteban? Sorry. Would that be me, Steve? Yes, it'd be the other Steve. <laughs> I, I can go. Um, so hi, everyone. It's so I, I'm actually I'm going to reverse the order just because I'm feeling humbled by everyone being here. My name is Esteban Rael Galvez, and I'm the project director of the Manitos Community Memory Project. Ah, your, your request, Chris, almost made me cry a moment ago because it took me back to that moment. Um, it, it, may, it may be a story that inspired a memory, but I think I remember it, um, but that's how memory works. My grandfather, um, Jose Albino Rael, had passed away in Cuesta, and my grandmother found me in the bedroom talking, just talking to the bed. And she came in and she said, pues, ¿con qué estás hablando? Who are you speaking with? And I turned around, I don't know, I have a memory that I was like two, I must have been able to speak. So however old one must be to be able to speak. And I, I said, as she would tell me, not skipping a beat, to Papa, and what is Papa? To? And I told a story about Papa. He had passed away the year before and that's the earliest memory. And it's in many ways inspired how I think about my role as a historian and gatherer of memory. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Stephen. And Steve? Gee. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Steve. Um, my earliest geographic location is probably running around chasing my grandfather as he was chasing his cattle in the wilderness. Uh, I was raised up in the mountains with, with my grandparents. Um, and I feel good. I'm excited to see what this project is all about and hopefully get involved. Thank you. And I choose, uh, gosh, Anna Nieder. Oh, uh, hi, I'm Anna Nietrauer. Um, my um, first geographic memory uh, would have been in Champaign, Illinois. And I would say that right now I am feeling very um, curious and I am honestly not sure who hasn't gone yet. I, is it, I think, I don't think we've Elena had- Elena and Pat. Oh. oh. I can go. Um, my name is Elena Valdez. Uh, nice to meet all of you. Um, a first location of first ge uh, memory or geography. Um, was probably in Los Ojos at Laguna del Campo. I don't know, Northern New Mexico, little village. Uh, my mom was carrying me. We got caught in a rainstorm. And I remember slipping uh, while I was in her arms and we fell in the mud. And my dad is just telling us to like, get up, come on, let's go to the, the truck. Um, and yeah, little village. And I'm feeling excited, curious and creative right now. I don't think we've heard from Ellen. And we have a new Elena too. So Ellen, can you, can you introduce yourself? 
Sure, I'm just enjoying so much hearing from everybody else. Uh, thank you, Chris. I'm Ellen. I'm with the New Mexico Humanities Council. I'm, um, my first memories, I was, I'm not sure where, but they're all from, uh, you know, growing up in the shadow of the Tetons um, in Moose, Wyoming. Um, and, uh, you know, I, when you first asked that question, Chris, my answer was, I feel like I'm among friends. And then I looked at all the people who are here today and I'm like, I don't even know half these people. And now hearing uh, all your stories, I, I, I do feel like I'm an, among friends. It's nice to be here. And then uh, Elena uh, Botkin, I can't see the full, the full name. Sorry, hi everybody, Elena here. Sorry to be late. Um, wonderful to join you all. It sounds like earliest memories we're sharing, is that correct? It's, uh, it's your name, the, the geographical location of your first memory and how you feel right now. Okay, um, Elena, she, her, um, feeling good and memory. Um, uh, we had some goats growing up. <laughs> and so I remember being in the backyard, um, very small, um, actually naked with some goats. So that's my memory. <laughs> Great, thanks. And Pat? Hi, um, hi everyone. It's nice to be here. My name is Pat Vigil Rivera, and uh, my first memories are here in Santa Fe at a time when the landscape of Santa Fe was very, very different. <laughs> and um, I wanted to come and, um, and, and learn more about the project. I was familiar through Esteban, but um, I'd like to get to know more as I've, through my uh, years here in Santa Fe, been very involved with, um, with the community and with the preservation of culture. So I did want to chime in and thank you for opening it up to, to whomever wanted to participate. And have we missed anybody? Great. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, and one of the things that we've discovered at Little Globe is that by doing these story, these story workshops, that we're always in the process of changing. We're changed by the stories that we hear. We're changed by the relationships that we form through through story. And similarly, in terms of being the, even this hour-long workshop, <laughs> we're already quite a far ways behind. Um, but it's something to actually to celebrate. Um, and you know, we as a group of artists and storytellers and filmmakers and the like, you know, we we celebrate the the basket of stories that we create here. Um, but we're going to take the next little bit and kind of walk you through some of our process. And uh, um, I just want to very quickly say that we've been doing this work for 22 years, and a lot of this work that we've we do now is a result of the work, the great work of others. And one of the people here in the room is Daniel Banks. Um, whose uh, amazing work with DNA Works has been an inspiration for us from the beginning. And, uh, and Katie, um, maybe you could quickly bring us through some of the guidelines, which Daniel, you'll recognize many, many of which we've, we learned from you. So Katie, you wanna walk us a little bit through? We, we really believe that our work should be grounded in, in, in um, the, the stories that we operate in are the same we're using the same principles and values that we're trying to put out in the world in terms of people being capable of coming forward with their stories. All members of our community have the means to be seen and heard. And by doing so that we live in a healthier, more robust community. So Katie, you wanna talk us through a little bit some of our guidelines that articulate that? Yeah, thank you. Um, so let me go ahead and share. So yeah, these are just some of our guidelines slash agreements slash beliefs. And um, we like to open up our sessions and our workshops with, with this list. So some of these are, are ones that we have come up with over the years, like Chris said, um, learning from other, other facilitators and practitioners. 
And then we also invite people to add their own to it. And part of today is a little bit of an abbreviated version of, of what we do, because obviously it's a shorter amount of time. So um, we'll go through this. So no one has to do anything that they don't want to. Um, these are exercises and the things that people want to do and share. And um, we've already kind of witnessed that in terms of you open up a prompt and, and people can interpret that and share as much as they want or as little as they want. And, and so we're, that's, uh, that's the first one. There's no good or bad in this work, no mistakes. Um, one of our most important ones is relationship before task that Chris mentioned as well. So taking the time necessary to build trust and relationships. Again, uh, you know, we, we took more time. Our, our icebreaker was originally gonna be maybe four minutes and, and it went into 20 minutes long. So that's kind of an example of wanting to take that time and, and, and seeing what the pulse of the group is. Um, and then, you know, as well as just when you're, when you're sharing stories, that's such a vulnerable thing. So it's really important to um, keep that at the top of the list <laughs> of uh, the relationship being important and, and uh, valuable. So then we have be impeccable in our work as artists and facilitators. So modeling, listening, and curiosity, which we've all done a little bit of. Um, embracing silences is another important one where um, we often feel like we need to fill those quiet moments and those silences, but that's often where people are reflecting and having that opportunity to take in what, what we've heard. So embrace silences, be willing to be changed and challenged. Again, um, just as you're listening and taking in what people say, um, having the ability to respond to that in a genuine way and, uh, and learn from people and be willing to be changed. Um, trusting the wisdom of the group and what emerges. Um, you know, we might have a, an idea of what the workshop is gonna look like, what the stories are gonna be about, and it might go in a totally different direction. So trusting um, what the energy is of the group and people that you're with. Um, our small circles represent a world of equity and complexity. We provide a forum that contains the history and complexity of ourselves, our visions and beliefs. So this is a really huge belief of Little Globes. Um, that we just live in a world of complexity. Our stories are complex, our feelings are complex, our experiences are complex. And rather than try to box people in or um, you know, take sides, it's really about embracing that complexity of, of our stories and our experiences and um, knowing that that might be uncomfortable also, but in embracing that. Uh, step in, step out. So, you know, as we're sharing stories and talking and discussing, if you're someone that talks a lot, um, maybe stepping back a little. And if you're someone who's quiet and tends to uh, be reserved, maybe trying out talking and coming and coming forward. And first thought, best thought. So not pre-thinking too much what you're going to say and what you're, how you're going to respond. Um, but just letting them come naturally. So yeah, those are some of our core beliefs. Do we wanna go into the breakout rooms, Chris? Yeah, let's see, so it's 4.37, so <laughs> our hour is winding down quickly. Well, and I did wanna say that, you know, we, we have an exercise in mind. Part of what today also is um, Little Globe is, is still learning this process of archiving, like we said in the beginning, and what that means once stories have been shared. Um, you know, we decided to call this session, whose story is it anyway? So, so part of this hour, is about discussing as a group and hearing from everyone about your ideas and thoughts about what happens once stories have been shared. Um, what an archive is for, who is it for, um, you know, its purpose and accessibility of archives and stories. So we did wanna take you through an exercise of sharing stories. We've done some sharing today, but I think it would be good too to go into breakout rooms and do another another sharing in smaller groups and then we can come back and, and discuss afterwards. Sure. 
So maybe what we can do is, is instead of having a 10 minute breakout session and sharing stories, we can have a shorter one. Maybe two minutes each. So we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna put all, with, with your permission, we're gonna put you all into breakout rooms, randomly placing two of you together that's kind of speed dating, story wise. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and the instruction is um, to, to uh, for two minutes, one person, maybe the person with the, thank you. Oh, here we go. Yeah. So, so whoever has the longest hair <laughs> goes first. And the long haired person <laughs> um, shares a two minute story. Um, answering one of these two prompts. The first one is, where do you have a sense of belonging in the town that you live and why? What do you, what do you have a sense of belonging? Or if you prefer, and this is actually something that Stevan uses a lot, think of an object that connects you to your family or your home and tell a story about it. And again, because of the fact that we really have such a limited period of time and we wanna make sure we have some reflection about this, um, this story process, um, two minutes each. So, so take two minutes. If, if you're the storyteller, uh, the A person, the first person to, to tell the story, take two minutes and, and tell your story. If you're, the if you're the receiver, really listen. Like, and, and listen with the idea that you will be able to share somebody's story afterwards. So you're listening to be able to tell the story back. So really sink into the listening part, clear your mind as much as you can and really take in the story. And then after two minutes, then switch places and the listener becomes a storyteller and the storyteller becomes a listener. And then we will reconvene and we'll share some of those stories back with the larger group. Does that make sense? So again, the two prompts are choose one of these two. Um, where do you have a sense of belonging in the town you live and why? Or uh, think of an object that connects you to your family or your home and tell a story about it, okay? So Shane's gonna put everybody into rooms. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. Hello? Hello? Hi, Robin. Hi, Shane. Are we in a breakout room together? I think so. There's nobody in the room that I was in, so I left. Oh, okay. Well, I hope I didn't put us all in our own breakout rooms. Like, I, I thought 11 breakout rooms and it would split it up, but maybe it didn't do that. I don't know. Uh, it's possible maybe it was like an odd number or something. Well, you have longer hair than I do, so I guess you're supposed to go first. Uh, sure. Um, I guess I have a sense of belonging and I live in Albuquerque and uh, I, I like living close to the river because it's sort of in the middle of town, but um, so I kind of like just being in the middle of things and um, I grew up in the Heights, so I really like the mountains, but I figure I can always access them, you know, and uh, yeah, right now I live in Wells Park. I like it. Okay. Cool. How about you? Um, well, I live in Las Vegas. Uh, it was a place I was born, and then I got moved away to California and and uh, um, came back as an adult, sort of feeling weirdly in that sort of... Uh, I didn't expect to come back and have a sense of belonging, knowing this wasn't really the place that I 
was from, even though it's where my heritage is and stuff, but the experience of that distance to something that I'm supposed to belong to, particularly in a place where belonging is of a premium is kind of an interesting experience. So, so yeah. Vegas, Nevada? No, New, New Mexico. Mexico, New Mexico. Yeah. Mexico. About, okay, that's what I thought. But yeah, it's about an hour from Santa Fe, so yeah. yeah I like Las Vegas, it's an interesting oh, yeah. town. Okay, so you come here, okay, you go to the hot springs, is that the deal? Yeah. Yeah, I've been up there, yeah, it's nice. I've climbed up to uh, Hermit's Peak one time. Ah, see, I've never done that. So cool. I'm going to check really briefly just because I'm worried since both of us went to a solitary breakout room. I'm worried so did everybody else. So I'm going to text Katie or maybe I'm, ho I'm, I'm hoping that's the case, but I've never done breakout rooms before. So I hope how many minutes did he say we were supposed to do? I think it was like six, something like that. All right. That's the other thing is I forgot to keep track of when we started. We've probably been talking for a couple of minutes. Okay. <laughs> so what what All is right. what is bringing you to this whole conference and and thing? Uh, so my my principal, I work at Cesar Chavez, um, in Albuquerque, and and she sent us the link, and it sounds uh, sounded interesting. So I'm a I'm an English teacher, but I'm also a writer and uh, artist. So oh, what like, kind of stuff do you write? I like just random short stories. I mean, I wrote a novel, but I didn't really publish it. And I mean, I just write for for yourself. Just random or? things. Yeah, I like weird short story kind of plots, and that's something I'd like to do more of. Just uh, limited on time a lot of times with work and stuff. But yeah, um, yeah. So I enjoy it. You know. Why did you decide not to publish your novel? I don't, I don't like being rejected, I guess. And it's, uh, it's not very, it doesn't fit a particular format all that well. Wow. It's like a, it's like a picture book for adults kind of. So it's, it's illustrated. Yeah. And I, I didn't really try that hard. I reached out to a couple of literary agents and they're like, no, it's not for me. And, and then I kind of, I don't know, I will publish it eventually, but it's, um, I don't want to pay for it myself really, which is like this other option, which um, I'm sure I can find a publisher, but it's like three grand or something to get somebody to do it. No, oh, yeah. So I'd rather somebody pay me for it. And uh, so I, might, I have to try it later. You know? um, but I think maybe I'll, I'll just find the right, the right person. I just have to try again, but it, you know. I hear you about that. Um, it's rough being a person that lives in the interstices, I guess you could say, where one's work doesn't, it's not easily commodifiable. So then what do you do? <laughs> yeah, you know, you want to do it on your own terms. And yeah, yeah. So. Shane, I, I think we probably ought to bring everybody back. Good. Okay, good. All right. Um, good. And I was worried because I only went into a room by myself. I was worried everybody else did too. So. Oh, no, we had a room of three. So. <laughs> okay, good. It, it mostly worked. Robin and I ended up in a room where we had a good chat. By the way, I just wanted to let you guys know too is, um, you know, I know that that first part took longer and I know everybody really does want to hear about what you guys have to say about the ethics. So don't worry about the time. I say this is one case that it's okay for us to break that boundary. Yeah. I think everyone's along for the ride. So we'll, we'll ask permission. I, I think yeah. it's, it's important to be respectful of the fact that people have allocated an hour and if it's oh, more totally. time. Okay, but I just want to say that I think everyone's along for the ride, but I, I see your point. Okay, I'm going to close all rooms. Okay, thanks. Bring everyone back. Okay, and then it's all you, Katie. Okay, uh, I guess they come back in six, and it, it, it automatically gives them a minute. So I'm going to oh, be back. Oh, interesting. In yeah, so we just want to invite, invite people. This is the first time I've ever done those as well. So I think everyone's coming back. It looks yeah, like. sure are. I don't know, it's just giving me all these weird messages and like not joined or I, I don't know where people went to. <laughs> Who knows what happened? Into the ether. Yeah. Yeah. The, the ghosts of the machine are inevitability. Yeah. Comes... Hopefully they hopefully they did their thing. How did you get me back? I was trying to send you guys texts because I was worried what happened, but I, I just left the room and it took me back to you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's right. You can leave rooms if you need to. Okay. So maybe that's what I should have done. But I, okay, that's good. Yeah, actually, for some reason, I'm not, not sure why I thought this, that somehow I was gonna be exempt from being sent to a room. 
And so getting whisked away was very disorienting because I was like, oh. I, <laughs> I don't have any joy yet. Yeah. Me too. I thought I'd be exempt. <laughs> but I... Yeah. <laughs> so good. It's, so people are coming back. Great. Okay. Sorry, guys, we were talking about how I didn't, I, I, I've never sent, I've never done the breakout room thing before, so I didn't know how it works. So I'm glad you all got to talk to each other. Yeah, let's see. Great. So um, we'd love to open it up and invite people to share briefly. Um, so you don't have to, but if you feel called to share, we invite you to do so. Um, so I guess if, if anyone wants to raise their hand, I can I can call on them. And also, okay, yeah, just one moment. Um, yeah, we did allocate an, an hour for this session. Um, we can go for an extra 15 minutes if people want to, since um, things are taking a little bit longer. So we may go longer, but feel free to leave um, after an hour if, if you need to. And um, and as far as the the sharing goes, you know, maybe just a few thoughts about what stuck with you when you were talking to someone. Um, you know, what details or what uh, a kind of a a summary of of what you shared with each other um, to the rest of the group. And I Katie, saw that can Ellen we share what we heard. Is that the idea? Yeah, so yeah. share back if, if you can. So, I mean, we're not going to have time, obviously, for everybody to share back what they just heard, but share if, just, just a few examples, just so we can kind of have something to, to work with. Um, if a few volunteers could share this, a story that you heard that was resonant with you and just do your best at reflecting back on what you heard. So if you can recount the story and some of the details, that'd be great. I'll be brief. Uh, I'll be brief. I happen to be in with Nancy and Pat and they both shared um, both the tangible and the intangible. They answered both questions, and but it was both about language, but also being able to touch a place and be part of a place that reminded you of another place. That's a summary. Great, thanks. Anybody else wanna share a story that they heard that was resonant? And we didn't necessarily go over this beforehand, um, but it's also good to have that agreement with your partner if it's okay to share their story. So some of you may be feeling like, oh, I don't know if I can share my partner's story. So that's that's okay to feel that tension right now and something that we should agree on beforehand. I can summarize since Esteban uh, summarized in our group and we feel, I guess it was all right because he did. Um, to have a physical representation and archive piece of history that was personally done by a family member is a treasure, even though that particular piece that he shared, um, the value of the Edga was not monetary value, but it was more um, useful in the times of, of that they were made. I really appreciated that he was, you know, is keeping that. If I could share a little bit just on, on the prompt of looking at an object, I think uh, it translates into a lot of different areas. O object could also be place, you know, when we did the geographical anchoring, et cetera, that, you know, place, place means it has meaning. There's an articulation, there's a memory, there's some kind of sustenance that you're drawing from. And that, that could be a tree, that could be a, 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 a ridge, it could be a river system. And so we understand much of the topography and we could, we could learn, we could understand it just at that level as a physical entity, as a, as, as a, as a place or as a space, but really when we make a relationship to it, that's when we transition it into being a place and that those are where the strong stories come is when we're anchored and we are able to demonstrate the meaningfulness of a physical entity such as a landscape, a river, a tree, et cetera. And that's, that's a, I think that's kind of a natural storytelling mechanism for us 
as we make relationships not only with other individuals, but also with the places and the spaces in, with which we articulate. We want to tell those stories and we want to make those relationships happen. And so, Eric, did did you did you hear a story in your in your breakout group that you could share with us? Well, one, if, if I, I I immediately anchored with Steve because Steve is is in Mayor Domo, and he 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 spoke about he was really if you don't mind, Steve, can I tell him your tractor story? Sure, sure. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Just the importance of the tractor, and not not only for personal utility. But it sounds to me like there it, it's a community artifact that people come to him and borrow his tractor. And so therefore it indicates that Steve is very much a part of community, service oriented, altruistic, big hearted. And, and, and even though I didn't get to see the face, I could tell just by the manner of his expression that he had all those qualities and virtues and values and is willing to share them. Great, fantastic. That was very nice. I wasn't sure I said all that. <laughs> Thank you. I interpreted it. Yeah, which actually brings us to a, Thank a, you. a question to pose to you all is, um, is having when you when somebody else shares your story or you've or you've given a story um, out and it is interpreted by somebody else, um, you know, how does that feel? Uh, how does it feel to have somebody else tell your story? If you if you've experienced that, um, can, does anybody else have have a a, a group story a, a story you heard in your group that you could ask permission to share and and uh, you want to share? Can I share um, from our group just in relation to Eric, Ellen, and Brent? Sorry, maybe it's better not. I've got a little wild one here. <laughs> I just, I just want to um, um, echo what Eric said because the place anchoring was what was happening in the group. If I could go, I think what Claire was saying was about place anchoring. And um, I, I also would just uh, would summarize or add to that, you know, I noticed that in all of our stories, um, place was very important and um, belonging was very important. The place um, that we all sort of had or we talked about, we, we connected it to, uh, to that belonging. And for um, each of us, it was definitely in nature. And that was really great. I, I enjoyed that that was, a commonality for all of us. And Brent, can you can you share one of those stories? Um, I think so. I, I well, Claire's not there, but I I think the story to share would be. Um, I really liked Claire's. I'm going to go, Claire. Okay. Um, she grew up kind of feeling. Uh, she grew up in Cuesta, outside of Cuesta, and uh, her family. Uh, she described as kind of a. At that time, they were like a hippie family. And so uh, part of the way that they became, felt more included in the community up in Cuesta was they, they worked on this park together and planted trees. And then over time, she saw how that helped her meet more people. And, um, and then she sort of always took care of that park, right? Because it was their park. And she, I think she even used the phrase, it became our family park. Um, and through that experience, she found a connection, community to the town that she grew up in, that she kind of maybe felt not always a part of. So I really like that element. And oh, and she also talked about how when we sweat together, we can connect. And I really liked that. I, I find that to be a big commonality in my experience as well. If you're uh, sweating together, you're getting to know each other. So Great. thank you for sharing that, Claire. And thank you for letting me share it back. <laughs> So Brent, a question for you then, in terms of just now sharing that, that story that you heard and you've reported back to this whole group, what is, how does it feel to share that story? Like, what mm -hmm. are your feelings? Do you have any conflicts? Is there, like, how, how is it that you navigated the moment of telling that story? Yeah, um, well, I think, 
I wanted to make sure that I told the right story, that I was telling the things that I heard. Um, so there was definitely a lot of, in my mind going, what were her exact words or phrases? And I was trying to remember those. Um, and it was important to me to tell, tell it correctly. Like I wanted to honor her telling of it and sharing of it. Um, and I think it was important for me to be brief. Like I didn't want to kind of keep going on <laughs> about trying to tell the story, but I wanted to sort of give the highlights of what I heard in order for other people to share in those highlights, I guess would be the way I'd say it. Like, so yeah. there's an inevitable interpretation. Right, right, a little bit. You have yeah. to do, right? And yeah. I mean, you know, as storytellers, we, one of the things at Little Globe we do is we will oftentimes go through a story generating process. And, and a few of you have been through this where we'll spend months gathering stories as a group, finding different ways of expressing those stories through different kinds of arts, both film, you know, filmmaking and spoken word, movement, visual arts, things like that. Um, and then those stories kind of get sometimes put into common spaces and we will oftentimes have to then take that and go through some degree of, of, of a violent process of taking sometimes 40 hours of material and reducing it down to a theater experience for an hour and a half or uh, a document, an hour long documentary film, things like that. And the interpretation and the decision making around editing those are all issues that we as a team have really had to grapple with a great deal. And, um, and even, you know, you can see that we could probably spend a few hours even exploring one another's stories and then the experience of both having your story told in front of the group, but also the story, the honorable position and the complicated position of, of telling somebody else's story. You know, it brings up to the surface, I think some of the ethics of storytelling we really wanted to share and explore with all of you. Um, Katie, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the some of the ethics of storytelling principles that this brings up? Yeah, I think you know um, we've learned a lot from a, a place called Story Center out of California, and they do a lot of um, storytelling in community, and they've come up with a set of principles and. A lot of them are around clarity and communication and transparency, which are really important um, to have at the beginning of a process. And um, and consent is really a, a huge one. And one thing I think we've learned a lot is um, is having that consent be something that you continuously check in about, you know, because the process, someone may give consent at the beginning to, to telling their story and you have no idea how that process is going to affect them, how they are going to be changed, how the people around them might be changed during that process. So um, it's important to, I think, have consent at the beginning, have a check-in about that consent and then, um, it, you know, and then try to have that at the end as well and, and give people the opportunity to always take their story back from the public um, and, and have that right. It is, you know, a story is a gift that people are giving and it's not something that um, should be treated as yours to take. So I think that's a, an important thing to keep in mind. Um, and yeah, again, being being transparent about what the stories may be used for in what in um, in what capacity, you know, in Little Globe, we might have a project where, uh, you know, we have certain parameters around the project, and that's what people think that container is for that story, and then later on, realize that story is relevant to some other project that we're doing or um, another outlet that we have. And we, we feel like it would be useful to showcase that story then. So um, that communication and talking with people about, about where their story is going, in what ways, um, and talking and being transparent about the fact that it may be edited or, or whatnot. And we've also been de developing more processes to allow people to um, have that ability to be a part of the story process and being helping to co-author their own stories. Um, so that can be filming themselves, uh, recording themselves and doing that footage rather than somebody else going in and, and, and recording and documenting. Um, so they're helping to tell their own story, but 
then that's always there's always the question of the editing of the story and um, something that you know to be honest we haven't fully cracked that nut in terms of you know a media making um, production the stories have to be edited down in some capacity so you know the ideal situation is someone is a part of that process all the way through the end um, that doesn't always happen so so those are some of the things that we keep in mind and that we also grapple with at the same time. Yeah, we, we really believe in kind of an iterative process. And again, I think that one of the beliefs that we have in-house is the same belief I think that we, we feel like is so important um, in the outside world as well, which is we are, our processes changed, our, our philosophies are changed over the course of a project. It's an iterative co collaborative learning. And it's, it, there's some rough and tumble. I mean, oftentimes mid process, we'll, we'll work with somebody who suddenly gets scared that, you know, they were so vulnerable in, in a session and they told a story that they really re regret having made public. And, you know, we will oftentimes need to hold a space for somebody to really express some complicated feelings. And for us as a group to be able to say, it's, it's okay, 100% okay. You know, you might have a really important story, but it's, you know, we, we don't in any way want you to feel like this has been a practice where your story is being used by somebody else, but something you want to share with the world because you think it's important. And um, I think so much of this work means that, you know, you, you may, we have had to go through the, the trouble of, of explaining to our funders that all of this work takes a lot more time to do equi equitably than, um, than it would seem like on the surface it should. And, you know, oftentimes I think that we say that you know, we have to put in 300% in order to get, you know, the collection of stories that we need to have a pretty full body um, collection of stories. Um, so I, I know that we're here in this, in a circle of people, many of whom are working in, in this arena. And I know that these are probably common um, questions that you all have. I would love to hear, we would love to hear some of your reflections about um, your own practices and your own challenges in terms of, uh, of being storytellers who are, in, who are given the honorable position of holding other people's stories and how you hold this ethical challenge of, of holding and telling other people's stories. I'm just curious if people have reflections here. Yeah, JT wrote something in the, in the chat, which is really interesting. Um, JT, would you wanna talk about that a little bit? Sure thing. Um, I'll, I'll read it because <laughs> I wrote it. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, so I am thinking about belongingness and responsibility to the story in addition to garnering consent to disclose a story which is not one's own. Um, authorship may become shared between all involved, including audience as they remember the story and experience of it in the future. And I'm, I'm thinking of that from an artist perspective or per you know, I'm a performance artist and I work in film and stuff like that. So, um, but it, so there's also the liveness aspect to it, you know, that it's, it's ephemeral, it moves through, you know, the atmosphere and um, it's just an interesting, really interesting thing to consider that <clears throat> when we absorb someone else's story, when we relate to it, it can become part of our own in certain ways that we are not the true author, right? There's um, some difference there, but also we, we can share in it and, and become authors in um, our own kind of communal way, I guess. Mm -hmm. Thank you. If I could mention, uh, I come out of a background, like Esteban, my, my background is anthropology. And with, within the training of that, I, 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 I do recognize that at times this was a discipline that was both authoritarian and appropriating of other people's stories. Mm -hmm. uh, and so even though the training is there, I, th I think there's still some carryover and it relates much uh, in, in relevancy of you know, what you're speaking about this idea of co-agency and co-authorship. And I think it, it brings to mind how very important it is the, the protocols that we use when we introduce ourselves and, and when we ask for this privilege of being able to work with individuals and share their, share their story. 
uh, again, giving agency and authority to, to the, the individual themselves, but asking for that allowance that we could be in, allowed to some degree interpretation and sharing and such. But we, I, 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 I say that again to emphasize this idea that to the degree that you establish a protocol when you're coming into that sort of gathering or, or that sort of recording or, or whatever mechanism you're using for asking for the, share, the sharing, the storytelling, that you be courteous and modest and, and, and non-appropriating such. And I'm not sure if that's gonna be part of the training that we look at you know, different versions of what those introductory protocols could or should be. Um, and, and Rich asks a similar question. Um, he says, uh, has Little Globe formed any kind of written internal review process for holding and distributing stories, uh, particularly elements of traditional knowledge that researchers in the past have exploited? And um, <clears throat> we, we utilize a, a number of different um, resources that we draw on whenever we do find ourselves in a moment where it's important for us to, to, to externalize a protocol in terms of ethical storytelling. And um, we found that the Story Center is a really good resource for that. And th they're always updating theirs and we're always updating ours in response. And Katie has really been instrumental in helping us to create those set of protocols. Katie, you have any, anything you wanted to share from that process? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, um, <clears throat> And Ellen put in our, our Culture Connects toolkit, which we, we created to kind of show that process of coming in, um, but es establishing that environment, um, the guidelines and, and agreements. And again, I think, you know, it's good to come in with a few of those in mind, but more importantly, um, coming, coming up with those together as a group, because they're going to be specific to the group that you're working with. Um, so I think that's an important process and just deciding for that specific group and those people and that context, um, what, what can, can, can we agree on in terms of the sharing of the stories and um, the collecting of the stories and, you know, and then the impact of those stories, where those stories go. And, we, and, and that's not always known at the beginning. Again, it's sort of, it's an iterative process. So it's something, um, that has to be continuously uh, brought to the surface throughout throughout the process. So not just something in the beginning, but again, something that you come back to throughout um, revisiting those agreements and revisiting, um, you know, are, are we following those and, and having that checks and balances is, is really important and doesn't always happen. And it's easy to get caught up in the, um, the energy of a production or of a performance or an, an event. And so, um, yeah, something that is important to, um, to revisit and try to make time for that as, as the energy gets going and things speed up. Can I share um, just something that came to me? By profession, I'm an educator. And when I hear what, you know, your process, I highly respect it because in the back of my mind, I keep thinking, had stories like historical stories been authentic, been truthful, not from somebody's perspective of what happened, but what actually was honoring the people whose story they're telling, where would our students be today having had that truth? So I just wanted to share the importance of what uh, stories and how they can impact uh, youth in the classroom. Yeah, absolutely. And we, we do a lot of um, media literacy workshops as well. And, and part of that work is to uh, especially with youth, there's so much consuming of media. And so um, helping, helping them understand that it's not just taking it in, but, how, but producing your own messages, producing, being in charge of your own narrative and your own stories. And, and that can be anything from, you know, a, an hour long film that somebody makes to, you know, a short Instagram post or something like that, that 
that there is that agency that, that everyone has and to have that awareness. Um, so yeah, thank you, Pat. Great. Ms. Stevan, I think you had something you wanted to share. Yeah, I was trying to type fast enough, but um, so from the very beginning, the Manitos Community Memory Project has prefaced the notion that we are dealing with, a commu with communities, Indo-Hispano communities who, that have been impacted by extractive practices, right? Cultural institutions, including museums, archives, and uh, scholars, maybe for good or bad, who have come into the communities and not recognized those relationships, right? So part of, for us, the first part is recognizing we're dealing with that type of community who has been severely impacted and not only shy, but reticent, right? So I hope, I, I wonder, I mean, Chris, you know, we've dealt with this with lots of projects. And I just wonder if anyone could speak, could share some of their thoughts about this. I just wanted to introduce it. Okay, well, Stefan, I, I, I just started typing something about extractive practices. So um, yeah, we, we are inheriting a whole uh, lot of disciplines that do practice this as extractive and exploitative. And so one of the things I think a lot about is um, reciprocity, how in the, in the process of, um, of story sharing, is it not just a collector and a collected um, what, what does it look like to actually create a, a process where um, everyone is, is in some ways, you know, how, how, do you, how do you even out those power relationships? Um, and then the other thing that I think a lot about is uh, that often the story gets centered without the storyteller's voice. So how do we center actually mm -hmm. the storyteller and not just their story as this, um, as this object? Um, and I think that those are two, for me, those are two really critical questions in these practices to not replicate those colonial um, extractive practices. Yeah, which is interesting because um, we talked about earlier how the story, once it's shared, is sort of out in the open and, and other people can have their own experience with that story. So how, yeah, how do you not treat it as just an object and this thing, but is, is a part of this person. Um, that's interesting. And it's, it's a big reason why at Little Globe, we, we really utilize um, a multiplicity of arts. So the storyteller can weave themselves through their own agency and through their own comfort uh, into the, the telling of the story itself. So on stage, they tell their own story. So they tell one another stories in, in, in community. And it's interesting how in many ways, I think, um, you know, we start demonstrating not, it's, it isn't about the story. In many ways, it's, it is about the storytellers, you know, and, and I, when we perform at a place like the Lenzerk or Capitol High School or National Hispanic Cultural Center, someplace like that, one of my favorite things to do is to sit and to realize like there's, we're all in this big room of people and there are people on stage and there are people sitting in chairs, you know, and I think there's a colonial model where that's a separate thing. But if you can sink back into it and, 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 and feel the fact that we're all in this room together and you see, you see the, the, you see the audience seeing themselves on stage along with the, <laughs> there's this incredible mixture of, of feelings and community and the stories themselves just become a means by which connectivity can happen in a way that we've never seen before. And to actually see in, in a broken heartedness style way, the storyteller on stage telling an incredibly vulnerable and complicated story, it, it, it becomes a form of leadership. It becomes a way in which we can all be more courageous about speaking to our experience in this world. Um, and so again, for us, the, the multiple artistic platforms becomes a way for the storyteller to really become more of, of a center than, than for it to be flattened into like an audio piece or a video piece. If I may just speak briefly for a moment to this, because uh, it's a thing that I've been thinking a lot about, right, is uh, 
storytelling often, and this is, I've encountered this all over the world, right, is not a very, is not often sometimes a very easy place to enter into. Storytellers can choose conditions, times of year, times of people's lives when certain stories are told. Like, I remember asking a Japanese friend to tell me about um, uh, a certain kind of music and once, and you know, he didn't want to answer the question immediately. He preferred that we wait till we were together and it was a whole afternoon and it involved being in certain places and being in certain times. He chose to have this deeply immersive storytelling experience. And this is actually the norm, not the exception, I think, with storytelling. Like, it's not often that, that place where it's a place of trust and is, is, is you know, uh, conditions and there's almost rituals to arrive where you get to hear the story is a, a lost sometimes in, in, in the gathering. So this idea of centering the storyteller and not getting that lost, that process of being allowed into the story space is often lost as well. I, I, if I could agree with you, on, Shane, on that one and, and really kind of bring forward the issue that, you know, oftentimes we're talking about de decontextualized story and, you know, the good storyteller really does lend for that contextualization. Now, certainly we're getting into digital age and other different kind of uh, media that, that allow us to really take it out of community, et cetera. So, so that becomes a challenge for us is, you know, how do you create that ambience? How do you recreate, recreate the rapport, which lends so much more meaning to the story? And again, you, 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 that, that's what the comedian's role is, you know, a, a comedian contextualizes the story that there's a relevancy, there's a relationship to it. And for me, that's always been a struggle for me is, you know, when, when I translate, when I hear a story and do a transcription to text, it's not even, you know, how, how does it even become approximate or even close to, you know, where, where, that, can, where that story originally came from and to be trustful and, and, and to reflect where that, where that sharing principle was out and where that relationship is out. And I, I think that's a, a, as for us to, to really be insightful and considerate is how do we re represent context? And I think, I think that's an excellent way. I mean, I, I know it's, it's time for us to wrap up, but I, again, I think there are many here in the room to, to, tonight that um, who do have experience in terms of stories and, and their relationship to archives. And I think that there's some really good um, discussion going on in the chat about the question of archive. Um, that, you know, how is it that an archive can be interactive and not static? And how is it that an archive can keep the storyteller in the center? And in, here in New Mexico, where we do have a richness of a connection with geography, where story and place can still have an integrity. You know, we're, we're on the verge of losing it. And I think, Eric, you're exactly right. Uh, the, the digital technology gives us great facility, but it does also provide the means by which we expedite, we expedient, we create more expedients around the, 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 the objectification of the story itself. And I guess my question is, if we can remove temporarily the colonial structure of the archive and, and ask of its, its utility first, can an archive of stories sit within a community itself so that there, it is in context? So that it is in, and have mechanisms such that it is animated within the living context of the vibrancy of daily life of people and their own relationship to the stories of their own place. Like that is the opportunity I think that we as we as a geography have here that I think a lot of other places, certainly in the United States has lo have lost. Um, but the conversation about the Manitos project and, and a lot of the work that we're all doing here in New Mexico and in other places, how do we keep that, that integrity between storyteller, story and, and location such that the archive actually helps to ensure that that's a living, continuing thing. I think it's one of the great challenges. You know, and in Little Globe, we have come from a place of documentary film and theater and dance and things like that. 
And I think that as we do mature as an organization and as a, a member of this community, that we are moving into a place of asking the question of archive because we now have gathered a few hundred stories and um, those stories have become disembodied from their original locations and in many cases from the people themselves. And so our responsibility as an organization as we go into the next phase of who we are is working in collaboration with the community communities that we are charged to serve to make sure that those that we have the new mechanisms in place to keep those located. And I'm just curious if there's any reflections here in the room about how that happens. How, we, how do we do this? How do we make an active, located, animated archive of story? That's it. We open up the drawers. We <laughs> we continually open the drawers and take things out and put them in. I mean, we we go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, oh, I was just gonna say. I mean, we we've talked a little bit about you know an art an archive on a, on a website, but how can you also um, maybe using technology place those stories in physical locations as well? So if you're if you're in in a place where the story took place or is related to that place, be able to listen to to the audio or or something like that. Um, so that's that's one idea. I was just going to say, Chris, it, it, maybe a closing because I want to be conscious of your and Katie's and everyone else's time on this. That these are the tensions and the opportunities that we are exploring with this project. Um, what, it, what it means to develop a community-based archive. For, I, I have some ideas. There are assumptions on my part, having worked in this field for a long time and in community, that they should, people want to see themselves reflected in these stories. They want to know that there's a place or some organization that is saving those stories, but not for saving sake, for preservation sake, but for for it to be used later on. So we're engaged in building the archive. That's gonna be the, that is the predominant focus of this entire project. We will, to the extent that we can amplify those in the future for the economic benefit of these communities, for the cultural benefit of these communities, cultural being like things like, I wanna see myself Right? I want to be able to look into an archive and see that my great, 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 great grandfather actually wrote his name here in Abiquiu. Like that blows people away. And that's one of the things, you know, there are challenges, Diane, welcome. Uh, uh, th there are challenges to technology for sure. Diane pointed this out. But I also see that there's some benefits and we're trying to explore those challenges and those tensions and really grapple with them, in, in, including the really hard things about the politics of representation. Who gets to tell whose story? Um, who gets to represent those stories? Who gets to save them? What does saving mean? And I mean, these are all of the messy questions that, that we deal with with this particular project. But ultimately, we want to create a repository that people can feel like they can go to, whether they're whether they their family has moved away to Wyoming, Trisha, unless she's gone, um, or they live in New Zealand. I mean, we have these communities have been displaced for all kinds of reasons. But you know, it's pretty amazing when we start to be able to tell a story, find a story in a repository that tells us who we are. And so we're exploring those issues, including all of these wonderful things. Chris, Katie, of course, you know, I'm part of Little Globe and I'm part of that family. And I've been able to work with you to explore some of these tensions. And, and I really appreciate you being with us today and sharing these things. I have a question. Yes. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can, Diane. Um, well, I was toying with the idea of um, doing what we're doing right now on Zoom with my relatives and meeting and having, you know, recording 
stories as a group coming together and recording stories. So are you uh, through the Manitos project thinking about doing this kind of thing where you, you have a storyteller that's available and then they're available on Zoom and any, anyone who wants to come and listen can join and listen to the storyteller. Because I believe that when you tell a story, the listener plays a key part. Um, they are the ones that can tease out more of the story. Um, so that's just my thoughts. My grandmother used to say the best storytellers are those who learn how to listen. Um, and Diane, it's almost like a commercial, like you've led me into one of our, one of the major components of this entire project, which is the Community Historians Initiative. I will write to you and anyone who is actually interested in that. Basically, the idea is that we will have community historians based in geographies, whether it's in uh, whether they're focused on a place like Plaza de los Leones, Walsenburg, Eric, um, or Cerro, New Mexico, or they're part like you, Diane, they, they're part of a diaspora, but they're interested in a certain geography, um, or they, they're interested in a certain type of theme, right? Like agriculture, or LGBTQ manito stories, or whatever that is, we want to gather those. So if anyone interested in that we're we're identifying community historians now with a small stipend that we can work with to work in community to kind of do i mean there are many ways to do that diane but that's one way that you just introduced i'll say more about that later i don't want to take any more time write, write to me diane or i'll write to you and i know that we are half an hour <laughs> over our promise time so very being very respectful and of course like you know i'm i would love to continue this conversation and and we'll certainly look forward to the opportunity to do so with all of you um there's there's much it, it's this is this has been a really marvelous conversation and um and one that i feel like i've learned a great deal um and i, I wish we could go deeper with some of these arenas but um i just want to thank shane and the Manitos Project and, um, and all of you for participating and the New Mexico Humanities Council and um, you know, this is a great thing. And uh, thank you so much for, for participating and for, for hearing us and listening and, um, and sharing stories. Well, thank you, Chris, and thank you, Katie. And yes, uh, you know, like we talked about, this is a dialogue. So we hope you guys will come back We continue to hear more. This doesn't have to be the final word on the subject by any means. So um, yeah, I guess we'll let everyone go. But thank you for today. Uh, it was really fantastic. So so thank you guys. Uh, you were uh, to start the conversation. I can't imagine a better start to the conversation. Than this, than this. So, so thanks, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shane. Okay. All right. Bye, everyone. <laughs>